monkey pox. This morning, the World Health Organization announced that because of concerns that the word monkey pox is racist and stigmatizing, the disease will officially be renamed M pox. <laughs> And I don't know who this is for. <laughs> you know, this sounds like they were trying so hard not to be racist that they ended up being racist. <laughs> you know, some guy was like, we can't use monkey. That immediately makes me think of, you know. <laughs> right? Come on, we're all thinking it, right? Am I the only one? Because here's the thing, if you're really trying to get rid of the stigma, just give it a completely different name, right? Because you realize you're just abbreviating the word that you don't want people to think about which works until someone says, what does the M stand for? <laughs> ah. In international news, a French court has officially ruled that companies cannot require employees to have fun at work after one man was fired for refusing to participate in office parties. <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you now, I am with this guy. Yeah, if you ask me, companies require way too much of their employees. Oh, you're making them go to office parties, team buildings, you're forcing them to wash their hands after going to the bathroom. It's too much! <laughs> you gotta pick one. Oh, in some news out of the Pentagon, the US Defense Department just failed a government audit with officials saying that they are unable to account for more than 60% of the military's $3.5 trillion in assets. Yeah, they just don't know where it is. I don't, I don't even know how it's possible to lose track of that much money. Like, what, are they waterboarding people with crystal? What are they doing there, huh? <laughs> and honestly, the Pentagon deserves to be punished for this. Unfortunately, they happen to have all the missiles, so we'll let it slide this time, Pentagon. <laughs> Ooh, but next time. All right, let's move on to some of the biggest stories of the day, starting with China, America's loan shark. <laughs> Ever since the coronavirus originated in one of China's major cities, Xi Jinping's government has been doing everything it can to clamp down on COVID-19. But after three years of some of the strictest lockdowns in the world, it looks like the Chinese people have officially had enough. Protests are spreading across that country. Thousands are taking to the streets, some even calling for China's president to step down. All of this amid rising frustration over the government's zero COVID strategy. Crowds swelled in defiance, <laughs> spilling over to the heart of Beijing. We want to be free! We want to be free! Chanting for freedom from the grip of a COVID policy that protesters say has worn on too long. They're calling for the end of lockdowns, the end of testing, all of the zero COVID measures that have ruled daily life here. Yeah, that's right. People in China are taking to the streets to protest the government's draconian COVID policies, which is a big deal. Because remember, China's not one of those chill countries. We can just like talk trash about the government or storm the capital or plot to kidnap a governor. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Protesting in China is, is a big deal. It's like growing up in an African family and trying to tell your parents that you don't think Noah's Ark is real, you know? <laughs> He's like, I'm just saying, mom, think about it. How can they fit all those animals on one boat? To be like, the same way I'm going to fit all this foot on your backside, huh? <laughs> Are you saying that Bible is not real? Are you saying that Bible? Oh, Jesus, help this child now, huh? <laughs> now, there are many reasons why China has been so hardcore with its lockdowns, right? Less than half of their elderly population is vaccinated. The Chinese vaccine isn't particularly effective. And the communist government has refused to bring in outside vaccines and obviously because they think it'll make them look bad. You know, it's the same reason I was reluctant to bring a dildo into my relationship. Yeah, no, I don't mind that you use it, but the fact that you cuddle with it afterwards, that's what hurts me, Candace! That's what hurts me! And, and almost three years into this pandemic, it is still crazy to see the range of responses from different countries around the world, right? China shuts down an entire city if one person coughs. Meanwhile, Americans are like, hey guys, I tested positive for COVID, so I'm just gonna play the first few rounds of Spin the Bottle tonight, okay? <laughs> Let's be responsible. Uh... <laughs> but let's move on from a dictatorship to someone who wishes they could start their own. Donald, you're making me crazy Trump. <laughs> Ever since Donald Trump announced that he would be running for election in 2024, many have been wondering, will this finally be the moment when he becomes presidential? 
Well, judging by his recent dinner party with Kanye West, the computer says no. Former President Donald Trump is facing fierce criticism tonight, even from his own allies, for having dinner at his Mar-a-Lago estate with controversial musician Kanye West and white supremacist Nick Fuentes. If you're not familiar, Fuentes is this high-profile figure on the far right, a Holocaust denier, but he's best known for running the America First organization, which according to the ADL, quote, seeks to forge a white nationalist alternative to the mainstream GOP. Even for Donald Trump, this was outrageous. Okay, first of all, first of all, this whole story sounds like the setup to one of those jokes that your uncle tells you at dinner, you know? Like, okay, so a racist billionaire, an anti-Semitic rapper, and a white supremacist walk into a bar. And then what happens? Hold on, the black waiter's coming. Hold, a Diet Coke, please. Thank you. Thank you. Secondly, why do journalists still act surprised when Donald Trump does Donald Trump stuff? Huh? Even for Donald Trump, this is, what do you mean even for Donald Trump? Is Donald Trump doing Donald Trump? Trump having dinner with Nazis is not outrageous. If he had dinner with vegetables, that would be outrageous. That would be crazy. <laughs> what? Yeah, and he was spelling words. What? <laughs> But because of this dinner, Trump has taken a lot of flack from all sides. And so in classic Trump style, he sent out a few posts about why, as per usual, he isn't to blame for anything that he did. But Mr. Trump tried distancing himself, posting on social media that West called me to have dinner, expressed no anti-Semitism, and claimed, I didn't know Nick Fuentes. Yeah, 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 in, in Trump's defense. I mean, how would he know that the guy Kanye rolls with could be a white supremacist? I mean, I get what he's saying. He's like, I just wanted to have dinner with this anti-Semite. I didn't know he was gonna bring a friend. <laughs> because I love how Trump tries to immunize himself by saying Kanye expressed no anti-Semitism at the dinner. A and then what? I'm also sure he didn't rap at the dinner, but you still know that he's a rapper. <laughs> now, you might be wondering, if Kanye didn't want to talk anti-Semitism at the dinner table, what did he want to talk about? Well, apparently, he was trying to convince Trump to not run for president, but not in the way you think. The dinner was not completely amiable. Trump became angry when West asked the 2024 presidential candidate to serve as running mate for West's own newly announced presidential bid. Ye posting this video to Twitter titled Mar-a-Lago Debrief explaining he asked if Trump would be his vice presidential running mate at the dinner. I think the thing that Trump was most perturbed about, me asking him to be my vice president, but then he goes on to say that Kim is a You could tell her I said that. And I was thinking like, that's the mother of my children. Trump started basically screaming at me at the table, telling me I was going to lose. I mean, has that ever worked for anyone in history? <laughs> You're going to lose. Tell him he's going to lose. lose. Tell me. I'm like, well, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> Trump. You're talking to Ye. <laughs> okay, first of all, Kanye, whoever made his video, they bleeped him when he said the thing that Trump said. And I'm going, you have people that bleep you, why don't you use them more? <laughs> you just be like, here's what I think about the boop, 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 boop. And also the fact that Trump got so mad at Kanye just shows you like where his priorities are. Right? He has no problem hosting a guy who wants to go death con three on the Jews or the Holocaust denier that he brought to dinner with him who he got along with. But if you ever suggest he should be number two on someone's ticket, Trump will be like, you disgust me, sir. Talk like that, there's no place in America. We don't talk like that in this country. <laughs> and I get where Trump is coming from. Kanye is asking Trump to be his Mike Pence. And Trump is probably like, ew, I could never be Mike Pence. I have sex with my eyes open. <laughs> the World Cup, where the United States has moved on to the round of 16 after defeating Iran 1-0. Yes, it's such an amazing win for them. It means that they go to the next round and they now get to say Iran instead of Iran. <laughs> In Hawaii, the world's largest active volcano has just begun erupting for the first time in 38 years, which is a shame. Another brother fallen 
during No Nut November. <laughs> it was so close, man. It was so close. In other science news, researchers have now reanimated a so-called zombie virus that has lain dormant under the Arctic ice for nearly 50,000 years. Yeah, now the good news is that Joe Biden is immune. He already had it as a kid. <laughs> and I know, I know a lot of people are worried. They're like, why are we doing this? It is dangerous to mess with viruses this way. But think about it, people, it's actually pretty smart because these viruses are eventually going to emerge anyway when the ice caps melt. So the quicker we can learn about them, the quicker we can make a vaccine that no one will take. Oh, and uh, <laughs> in some legal news, a Florida woman is suing Kraft Foods over its microwave mac and cheese, arguing that while the box says it's ready in three and a half minutes, that doesn't include the amount of time it takes to add the water and then wait for the sauce to thicken. <laughs> and you can laugh, <laughs> but she's right. I mean, the box doesn't even include the time it takes for me to cry over the fact that I have to eat Kraft mac and cheese for dinner. <laughs> That's another 45 minutes. And you know, stories like this make you think about, it must be so hard for the lawyer who works on a case like this to discuss their work with their peers, you know? They're, like, they're just sitting in a room, it's like, I'm working on a case to protect the right to abortion in the South. It's like, yeah, I'm working on it. A case to shut down a company that's been poisoning the water of poor communities. Uh, how about you, Alan? It's like, uh, well, you know, you know how sometimes mac and cheese takes longer <laughs> to make than you expect? All right, well, let's move on to some of the biggest stories of the day. Starting with the ongoing firestorm facing Donald Trump, former president and host of the most disturbing dinner since the one Jeffrey Dahmer had. Last week, Trump ate dinner at Mar-a-Lago with Kanye West and a prominent white supremacist named Nick Fuentes. And we don't know exactly what happened at that dinner, except that nobody ordered latkes. But <laughs> apparently, a lot of Republicans don't think it's a great look for the leader of their party to be splitting apps with neo-Nazis. Donald Trump facing growing backlash to his dinner last week with prominent white nationalist Nick Fuentes. Republican politicians now among those calling out the former president. I think there's, uh, it's been clear that there's no bottom to the degree to which President Trump will uh, degrade uh, himself and, and the nation. Well, I think he'd make better choices, obviously. That was a bad decision. There's no place for that in the Republican Party. Uh, president Trump was wrong. Uh, uh, to give uh, a white nationalist, uh, um, an anti-Semite, and a Holocaust denier a seat at the table. And uh, I think he should apologize for it, uh, and he should denounce those individuals uh, uh, and their hateful rhetoric without qualification. Let me just say that there is no room in the Republican Party for anti-Semitism or white supremacy. That's right, there's no room at all because we're already full. Yeah. I mean, we do have room for someone who hates Dothrakis, but uh, that would be a new one. You know, it's so funny watching Republicans try to chastise Trump for hanging out with someone who has the exact same views as him without chastising Trump for having those views, right? Because here's the thing, I'm willing to believe, I'm willing to believe that Trump didn't know who Nick Fuentes was when he came to his dinner. As Trump says, I'm willing to believe that. But you've got to admit, it says a lot about him that he enjoyed this man's company and everything that he had to say, right? Like if your friend brings Darth Vader to your house for dinner, that's not your fault. But 15 minutes in, any decent person would be like, I'm not comfortable with how much this guy talks about blowing up planets. Also, why is he wearing a mask? We've all been tested. <laughs> And it is nice, it is nice to see Republican officials speak out against Trump for a change. But we all know how this is gonna end. Republicans get mad at Trump for a little while, and then they always get back together with him in the end. Trump scandals are basically like Hallmark movies, you know? <laughs> Except Trump never actually changes and becomes a better person. It's just like, Donald, either you choose your career or you choose me. He's like, well, I choose my career. Okay, you can have me too, Donald. <laughs> but let's move on to some news about trains, or as I call them, Choo-choo trains. <laughs> you may think about trains as just a form of transport or a place where people gather to solve murders, but they're not just that. It turns out that trains are responsible for carrying billions of dollars in goods across America every year. But over the past few months, railroad workers have been trying to negotiate better working conditions with the railroads. And the dispute has gotten so bad that now President Biden, Amtrak Joe himself, is stepping in. 
President Biden is calling on Congress to avert a looming rail strike and impose a settlement that some union members rejected. The president's involvement signals a major shift for him he, that could potentially pit him against his union allies. But right now, George, he says that, that he was reluctant to get involved in this one, but the potential that, cripple, that this could cripple the economy was just too much. A strike could threaten everything from farming and food to crucial chemicals for clean water, causing major supply chain disruptions. Yeah, that's right. A railroad strike wouldn't just inconvenience passengers, it would devastate the entire economy. Which, you've got to admit, sounds weird in 2022, right? <laughs> no, it does, because railroads feel so old-timey. You know, it's like, on oh, the railroad! <laughs> and it's like, it'll devastate the economy. Now it's like finding out you're losing your job because the whale hunters union went on strike. <laughs> you're like, but I work on computers. Yeah, well, actually, the internet runs on whale oil. Huh? What are you gonna do? <laughs> now, the situation is complex, but basically, some railroad unions are threatening to strike because despite railroad companies making billions in profits, workers' schedules are so unpredictable that they can't plan their lives, and they definitely don't get nearly enough sick days, which they deserve. Especially because every few train rides, they have to climb on the roof because they hear a sound, and there's James Bond who's coming to punch them and take over the train. <laughs> That's at least a mental health day. <laughs> so it's kind of messed up for Joe Biden to step in and forbid the workers from striking. You know, that's the only point of leverage that workers have. If they can't strike, what are they supposed to do? Be like, all right, we'll run the trains, but when we blow the whistle, it's gonna be real sad. Choo choo. <laughs> At the same time, though, I can see why Joe Biden is willing to stop the unions from going on strike. He can't have the economy take a hit on his watch. His administration has enough problems. High interest rates, war in Europe. Uh, they can't find a sitter for Pete Buttigieg. Times are hard. <laughs> but if anyone can solve a train crisis, it's Joe Biden. This man has spent his whole life obsessed with trains. This is his moment. Can you imagine? It's made for him. This is like if Trump had to solve a crisis involving the Mac rib, you know? <laughs> He's just like, everyone out of the room, Melania, get me the hamburger on a secure line. We're gonna solve this. But this is yet another reminder of all the things happening in the supply chain that we all just take for granted. Right? We take it all for granted because a banana doesn't just show up in a grocery store. Somebody grows a tree in Costa Rica, and then it's picked, and it's loaded onto a truck, and then a ship, all right? And then another truck, and then a train, and then another truck. <laughs> and that's when you buy it at the store. You put it on your counter, and you let it slowly rot before throwing it <laughs> in the garbage. And that garbage is picked up by another truck, and then it's shipped back to Costa Rica. It's actually beautiful when you think about it. It's a circle of life. All right, finally, history is full of famous feuds. You know, Godzilla versus Mothra, Swifties versus Ticketmaster, <laughs> Herschel Walker versus condoms. And now there's a new one. Elon Musk, the world's richest man, is picking a fight with the world's richest company. Elon Musk has a beef with Apple. He claims the tech giant has threatened to pull Twitter from its app store. A move like that would, of course, crush Musk's new company. Musk tweeting a series of claims against Tim Cook and company, calling out the iPhone maker for pulling back on advertising on the social platform, also complaining about the 15 to 30 percent fee that is placed on app developers. Musk also said that Apple had threatened to remove Twitter from its app store as part of its review moderation process. He likened this move to a suppression of free speech. This is a battle for the future of civilization, he writes. If free speech is lost, even in America, tyranny is all that lies ahead. <laughs> really, Elon? Tyranny? You can't, you can't give the Braveheart speech about everything. Everything? This dude is walking around Twitter headquarters like, this threatens the very existence of democracy and mankind. And the janitor's like, okay, geez, I'll refill the paper towels. Stop shouting. <laughs> now, we, we should unpack this a bit because Elon went full on ludicrous mode yesterday with a bunch of different claims about Apple. The first thing he complained about was that Apple stopped advertising on Twitter, which he thinks is an attack on free speech. And maybe it's just me, but do you, like, do you also find it funny how free speech and giving Elon Musk money always seem to be perfectly aligned, <laughs> right? Elon's like, oh, so the world's most perfectly, perfectly pr protected brand doesn't want ads showing up next to Nazi memes? I guess you believe in censorship, huh? 
Secondly, Elon is bitching that Apple has threatened to drop Twitter from the App Store. And if that's true, it's probably because Apple requires all of its apps to be safe. And Musk has essentially fired all the people who are responsible for content moderation and replaced them with a sign that just says, hey, don't post that. <laughs> and the third point, the third point that Elon's crying about is that Apple has too much power over iPhone apps. Yeah, because if he charges $8 a month for Twitter verification, Apple automatically gets to take up to 30% of any money people spend in the app. And Elon doesn't want that. I mean, he can't afford to give 30% of Twitter's money away just because some idiot made him spend $44 billion on an app that we all use for free. <laughs> he can't afford that shit. And so that's where we are right now, the richest company versus the richest man in the world. And the stakes could not be higher. Because remember, the outcome of this war could determine how we spend our time while we poop. <laughs> Today is Spotify Wrapped Day. Yeah. Yeah. The day that Spotify looks at our music and reminds us that we're all a basic bitch. <laughs> and you know, I was thinking, thank God Tinder doesn't do a year-end wrap-up. <laughs> Just to remind you of all the terrible decisions you made on desperate nights. It's like, wow, I did a lot of people with pet snakes this year. <laughs> In international news, the United Nations has officially added the French baguette to the UNESCO World Heritage List. <laughs> Which is cool, but it's another reminder that the United Nations really needs to eat lunch before making big decisions. <laughs> it's like, should we give Chinese food a seat on the Security Council? I'm so hungry. <laughs> And you would think that this is great. I see some of you clapping. Oh yeah, I love baguettes. But remember, now it's protected by the UN. <laughs> yeah, so now every time you try and take a bite out of a baguette, a peacekeeper's gonna jump out and kick your ass. They're like, pa, stop that shit. <laughs> Meanwhile, in presidential news, Joe Biden's Secret Service detail had a bit of a scare recently when five cars they had rented suddenly burst into flames after they were returned to Hertz rent a car. Yeah, now the good news is, Biden has got full coverage insurance. <laughs> the bad news is Senate Republicans blocked it, so he's gonna need to borrow some money from Kamala now. <laughs> but my question is, why is, the, why is the Secret Service even renting cars from Hertz? <laughs> why is there a person who was thrown by that? With, like, like, what happens if the SUV they want isn't there? What, now the president is rocking up to a state dinner in a Hyundai? Is that how it's gonna work? <laughs> And while we're talking about things exploding, experts say the United States is now facing a shortage of bomb-sniffing dogs. Yeah, which probably explains how Morbius made it into theaters. <laughs> and it makes sense, you know, when you think about it. You know, of course this was always gonna happen. If you had the choice of being a bomb-sniffing dog or a drug-sniffing dog, what would you choose? <laughs> huh? What would you choose? simple. Yeah, option A, you might explode. Option B, free cocaine. I mean... <laughs> it, is, it is hard for us humans, though, you know, because now, you know what this means, we're gonna have to resort to bomb-sniffing cats. <laughs> and their noses are good. They can figure out where the bombs are, but they just won't tell us about it. <laughs> yeah. The cat will be there like, mm, I have nine lives, bitch, not my problem. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some of the biggest stories of the day, starting with the 2022 midterms. And I know what you're saying right now. You're like, but Trevor, the midterms are over. I killed them. I watched them die. Well, you thought you did. <laughs> but you never took a headshot. And after you left, the midterms busted out of the dirt, and now they're back. <laughs> because down in Georgia, they're just a few days away from a runoff between incumbent senator Raphael Warnock and the reason you're pulling your son out of football, Herschel Walker. <laughs> And we're gonna tell you all about the latest updates in another installment of Vote Demic 2022. <laughs> there is now less than one week to go until the Georgia runoff election, and once again, Herschel Walker is battling controversies. First of all, he might not even live in the state that he's trying to represent. Yeah, according to new reports, the Georgia home that he's claimed as his residence has actually been rented out for years. Yeah, and apparently Walker even admitted in a speech earlier this year that he lives in Texas. <laughs> Which I was shocked about because I did not think Herschel Walker knew the names of two different states. This was <laughs> really impressive. 
I know this might piss some people off, but when you think about it, this just proves that Herschel Walker views Georgians as family because he's never around them. <laughs> and of course, of course, there's the other problem for Herschel Walker, which is that every time he speaks, things go wrong. <laughs> for instance, Walker was recently at a campaign stop giving his views on the border, right? And in his speech, he's trying to explain why he will build Donald Trump's border wall. But in a way that only Herschel Walker can, he goes on to debunk his own argument about a wall <laughs> and then takes us on a wild ride that somehow involves his dog. Security the border. They said, how are you gonna do that? I said, well, I can do it then. You better put up a wall, a wall to work. Wall working around your house when you got a wall around your house, people don't do it. They, have a, they can get in, but you know what? They get in, it'll be hard to get out because I got a dog that, well, my dog really won't bite, but he put it bad anyway, but anyway. Sorry, what? <laughs> Did this man just win an argument with himself? Because <laughs> he's like, I think his plan is to, what, build a border wall so that he can trap immigrants inside America? Is that what he's doing? <laughs> but you see, once they get in, they can't get out. Then they gotta get a job and raise a family, settle down, and that's how we get them, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, it's almost like, it's almost like Walker started out talking about border security and then ended up telling everyone how to break into his house. <laughs> and personally, I don't think he needs a wall, you know? Because the hardest part about breaking into Herschel Walker's house is figuring out which state it's in. Ha <laughs> ha, joke's on you. I actually live in Kansas, Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's move on to some news from social media. Ever since Elon Musk pranked himself into buying Twitter for $44 billion, <laughs> he has been trying to reshape the entire website according to what he likes. He's brought back thousands of suspended accounts, He's made it easier to get a blue check mark. And now any number you tweet is automatically changed to 69. <laughs> yeah. You post that your dad only has three days left, now he has 69. Nice. <laughs> Rest in peace, but nice. <laughs> but Elon's biggest promise is that under his leadership, Twitter is completely open for free speech, no matter how wrong that speech might be. A potentially dangerous new change on Twitter. The social media site is no longer enforcing its policy against COVID misinformation. Twitter suspended more than 11,000 accounts for breaking the policy and removed almost 100,000 pieces of content between January of 2020 and September of 2022. And Musk is promising to restore many previously banned Twitter accounts as soon as this week. Health experts are concerned that it could diminish efforts to stop the spread of the virus and could discourage vaccinations. Okay, look, maybe this is my vaccine microchip talking, but <laughs> I don't think it's responsible for Twitter to bring back the people who are spreading COVID misinformation. You know, but, but on the other hand, on the other hand, it is 2022. Like, how can you still be misinformed about COVID? You know, we're just running around like, I heard the vaccine turns you into a lizard. Mother it's been three years. Do you see any lizards? <laughs> You see any lizards here? They probably hired it. And, and forget COVID for a second. It's crazy that anyone would go to Twitter for any medical information. <laughs> you know, people should be going to the doctor for this stuff, but because no one can afford a doctor in America, people are out here searching hashtag bump on my dick and hoping to find a cure. <laughs> They're like, cocaine on my penis? That's not what I was looking for. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to some news coming out of San Francisco. Like many big cities, San Francisco has been struggling to get crime under control. And if you're thinking, oh, it's San Francisco, what are they doing, prescribing all the criminal CBD oil? No. <laughs> I mean, yes, but not just that. <laughs> they also have a more hardcore solution. New this morning, San Francisco officials voted to allow city police to have remote-controlled robots that could use deadly force in extreme situations. Critics of the decision say it militarizes San Francisco's police, but city supervisor Rafael Mandelman, who voted in favor of the robots, said that the killer machines would only be used if lives are at stake. SFPD said they don't have pre-armed robots, and they don't plan to arm the ones they do have with guns. Assistant Chief David Lassar said they could deploy robots equipped with explosives. Wait, 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 what? What? They're not gonna arm the robots, they're just gonna give them explosives? That is much worse. <laughs> who, who came out with that PR statement? Don't worry, people, the robots aren't gonna have guns, they're just gonna be suicide bombers, okay? <laughs> Calm down, everyone's going. 
was such a bad idea. Do you know how often robots make mistakes? Can you imagine if Siri had a bomb? It was like, hey Siri, play 21 Savage. Now killing your family. No! No! Wait, which, which members of my family? But still no, but let's talk about it. Now, to be clear, just so we're on the same page, the robots will not actually be deciding when to use deadly force, all right? They will still be trained human police officers on the remote control trigger. So don't worry, it's still gonna be mostly black people that get killed. <laughs> and it's wild, it's wild how cities can always find money for high-tech gadgets for cops, but when it comes to investigating or like investing in long-term solutions that might actually fix the problems, then their pockets are empty. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, robot money, we got that, we got that. People asking, they're like, wait, you're building robots that are police with bombs? Can, can we do something about like the homeless people? They're like, oh yeah, yeah, the robots can blow them up too. Yeah, we can handle that. <laughs> Makes no sense. The Democratic Party, easily one of the top two parties in the United States. <laughs> as you know, Democrats lost control of the House in last month's midterm elections. And as they get ready to be in the minority, they're making some big changes at the top. Democrats in the House have made history with their new leadership. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of Brooklyn has become the first black leader of either party in Congress. He will take over from Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who, as you know, is remaining in the House after stepping down from the top job. Jeffries is 52, 30 years younger than the outgoing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, a leader with a style all his own and a penchant for weaving in the legacy of hip hop. That is why we are here, Mr. Seculo. And if you don't know, now you know. I'm glad no one else in the room finished that lyric. <laughs> and I don't know, as much as I enjoy it, I think it feels kind of weird to quote Biggie in such a serious and boring place like Congress. Like, I love, I love hip hop, I love hip hop, but I don't wanna hear it everywhere, you know? Yeah, like I don't want my doctor shoehorning that shit in. <laughs> so, Mr. Noah. What are your symptoms? Palms sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. <laughs> Please take this very seriously, I'm very ill. <laughs> but that's right, after 250 years, America finally has a minority, minority leader, which is amazing. <laughs> Although you will notice the Democrats only gave it to a black guy after they lost the house, yeah? It's kind of like someone crashing their car and then being like, hey, Akeem, I know you've always wanted a BMW, no need to say thank you. <laughs> also, the cops want to talk to you, bye. <laughs> But no, you still, you still have to give credit to the Democrats, right? Republicans haven't done this yet. I mean, they still think minority leader was the original title of Black Panther. And this isn't <laughs> just a big deal because Jeffries is black, remember that. This also marks a shift for the Democrats to a much younger generation of leaders. Yeah. Although again... <laughs> I mean, we also don't really know, you know? No, because Hakeem Jeffries is black, so he could be like 90. We don't actually know <laughs> how old he is. Because you realize even at 52, for a party leader in America, he's actually a young man. I mean, think about it this way. Joe Biden was in Congress when Hakeem was literally in diapers. <laughs> and now that Hakeem is in Congress, Joe Biden is the one in diapers. <laughs> the circle of life. If we had more time, we could talk about how the House Democrats are just a sideshow for the next two years because the main event is whether Kevin McCarthy will be able to wrangle his clown car of crazies to get anything done. But we don't have the time to talk about that because while Hakeem Jeffries is plotting to take over the House, Elon Musk is plotting to take over our brains. Elon Musk said on Wednesday a wireless device developed by his brain chip company Neuralink is expected to begin human clinical trials in six months. The company is developing brain chip interfaces that it says could enable disabled patients to move and communicate again. We've been working hard to uh, be ready for our first human. It's essentially that it's sort of like having an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, uh, re replacing a piece of skull with like a, you know, a smartwatch. <laughs> you have a Neuralink device. Like I could have a Neuralink device uh, implanted right now and you wouldn't... <laughs> You, you wouldn't even know, I mean. Yeah, yeah, Elon, if, if you told us you were part robot, all of us would be totally surprised. We, we would we'd be like, I never saw that coming. <laughs> now look, I, I will admit, the idea of this technology sounds amazing. But in reality, 
the idea of an Apple Watch or a Fitbit in my brain <laughs> gives me a little pause. Because have, have you ever used an Apple Watch or a Fitbit? When it messes up on my wrist, I'm just like, ah. When it messes up in my brain, <laughs> then what? All of a sudden, I'm on Alex Jones praising Hitler for inventing the microphone? Is that what's gonna happen? I'm just like, ah. And secondly, if I'm gonna get a chip in my head, I don't know if I want Elon Musk to be in charge of it, you know? Like, a year ago, I would have been like, the Tesla guy? Maybe, maybe. But now I'm like, the Twitter guy? Mm. <laughs> I'll pay him $8 to stay away. <laughs> now, if we had more time, we could talk about how Elon previously promised that his brain chip would be ready for human trials three years ago, or how he promised that Teslas would be self-driving by 2017, or how he'd build a high-speed underground train by 2020, or how he'd land on Mars by 2022. Basically, this dude is a guy in a strip club making it rain with IOUs. But <laughs> we don't have time to talk about the techno king because some real royals have just rocked up to America's shores. It was a royal welcome for the Prince and Princess of Wales Wednesday on their first U.S. visit in eight years. Here to present the Earthshot Prize, which honors environmentalists. They kicked off the trip by helping turn Boston City Hall green. Catherine and I are absolutely delighted to be with you today for our first engagement in the great city of Boston. The couple also took in an NBA game courtside, watching the Boston Celtics beat the Miami Heat. And then they hold this big star-studded event on Friday night where they're gonna hand out five prizes worth more than a million dollars each to folks who are trying to tackle the climate crisis. Okay, first of all, Prince William is clearly a liar, right? No one has ever been delighted to be in Boston in December. <laughs> December? What are you excited for? Oh, I love chapped lips and getting thrown up on by Patriots fans. How peachy. <laughs> You've been there in December? And you might be saying, no, Trevor, they're having a good time. They even have courtside seats. You think these people are impressed by courtside seats? <laughs> the man's regular seat is a throne. <laughs> this man has never sat on a folding chair in his life. <laughs> He's probably like, look at this thing. This chair has a mouth or something, Kate. <laughs> Now, if we had the time, we could talk more about how great it is that Prince William and Kate are awarding money to people who are trying to solve climate change, or how shitty it is that they ignored my idea to plug in a bunch of air conditioners near the glaciers. Would have worked, but we just don't have the time for that. Because while these royals are having fun in America, the royals back home in the UK are not having a good time at all. Overshadowing the trip, controversy back at Buckingham Palace. The prince's godmother, Lady Susan Hussey, resigning amid accusations of racism. Ngozi Fulani, the founder of a women's nonprofit and a black woman born in the UK, says Tuesday at the palace, Hussey repeatedly asked where she was really from, implying she wasn't really British. Ngozi Filoni tweeting the exchange, which reads in part, What nationality are you? I am born here and I'm British. No, but where do you really come from? Where do your people come from? Hussey also asking, quote, what part of Africa are you from? After Ngozi said she was from London. Tonight, an eyewitness describing her shock at the exchange. If Ngozi was a white woman, that line of questioning wouldn't have taken place. People, how many times do we have to go through this? There is only one socially acceptable way to find out someone's heritage. You swab their DNA while they're asleep, okay? <laughs> It's the polite thing to do. <laughs> this is like the first thing they teach you in Avoidable Racism 101. <laughs> it is just never say the word from. <laughs> That's it. A lot of racism includes the word from. So just avoid it altogether. Where are you really from? Go back to where you came from. <laughs> you see this clip from Tucker Carlson? <laughs> from, just stay away from it. And I also love how this woman was given a chance to control, out, delete her racism, right? But instead she just copy pasted and carried on. Where are you from? I'm born here and I'm British. No, 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 you don't understand. I'm being racist. How black are you? <laughs> Show me on this map of Africa I brought with me. Oh, let me put it in words you understand. Ganga, 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 ganga. Ganga, Coke bottles falling from the sky. Before we go. Please consider donating to One Simple Wish, a charity that grants wishes to kids and young adults who are in foster care. If you wanna help grant a wish or donate towards their holiday wish fund, then please do so at the link below. <laughs> 